some familiar faces and familiar organizations. And uh, um, and it's great that you're able to hold these meetings online um, currently because it does seem like folks are able to attend from outside the city and county, which is um, which is exciting as well. So my background is um, well. Long time ago, engineering, but I went to San Francisco State uh, for a graduate degree in geography, and um, during that time, got involved in a restoration in Golden Gate Park, and uh, you know met Christopher Campbell and Lisa Wayne back in the day, um, and then from there have done various things: uh, a little bit at state parks, a little bit up in Mendocino, um, a little bit down in the South Bay at Coyote Ridge, but mostly since um, 2002. Uh, Calypsy, and uh, I look forward to telling you a bit more about the organization in a minute. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Doug. Um, so I'm Peter Brasto, and I work closely with Chris on lots of stuff. They call me the biodiversity coordinator for the city, and I work at the Department of Environment. Um, and I've been at the department uh, since December 2012, so almost, gosh, almost eight and a half years, which is kind of amazing. Um, and uh, I'm going to give a little bit more background about myself as well. But uh, for fun, I put together a series of slides to do that. So um, I'm going to share my screen and start up the PowerPoint right now. If I can click on the correct window here. All right, can everybody see that? Yes, sir. All right, so the funny parenthetical additions there are because we're both talking about the San Francisco weed management area, which is what I'm going to focus on. But Doug is going to be talking about weed management areas in general across the state of California and the program. So um, that's going to be our subject of today, and we're really excited to be here. Um, found this fun shot of Cape Ivy invading a willow woodland down there below. Uh, and so just um, some weeds to get you into the mindset of what we're going to be talking about today. These are what we call the San Francisco Six which uh, I'll talk more about in a little bit. Um, but these are some of our favorites, some of our worst weeds uh, in San Francisco and in the Bay Area, uh, certainly along the coast. And, um, and I'm gonna be uh, showing some more slides, uh, sort of a photo gallery, if you will, of, of weeds in a little bit. And um, so start thinking about your, your favorite worst weeds as, uh, as I'm talking. And so here's just our quick agenda for the day, um, for the morning. Uh, as I said, so I'm going to go first and talk about some weeds. Uh, and then Doug is going to talk about uh, WMAs in general and Calypsy and all the great work um, that they bring uh, from a state level and then also at a Bay Area level. Uh, and then we're going to focus back in on San Francisco and I'll tell you about the background of the San Francisco WMA and, uh, and then we'll wrap it up with um, you know, what What should we be doing in the San Francisco WMA and how are we going to um, work together going forward? All right, so um, I just thought I'd start off uh, with some slides to introduce myself because um, I have lots of pretty slides. And so and also for you to maybe, you know, answer the question, who is this guy who sometimes acts like he knows what he's talking about when he uh, pipes up during these meetings? So um, I've been around uh, for quite a while on the scene and actually went to school in geography at UCLA back in 93. Uh, so another geographer um, didn't finish my master's, though, because I got sucked into working um, at the Presidio uh, way back and started as a volunteer there in 94. Uh, and then really the first significant restoration project was in 1995. Sharon Farrell was hired there as the first biologist on the Presidio back in the end of 1993. And so I kind of came in early on the scene there and uh, and that's kind of where I got started. Um, and this, of course, is a much more recent image. This is probably from about 10 years ago, looking out from the from the east, looking west, kind of southwest over Lobos Creek Valley. It used to just look like a derelict ball field with um, a little, little teeny patch of the fairly listed endangered Lysinga, uh, San Francisco Lysinga, and kind of right where these oaks are. Um, and then the whole area was restored, of course, starting in 1995. Uh, and so I was out of the Presidio for about 10 years um, and ended up as the as the restoration coordinator and stewardship coordinator for the Presidio from about 02 to 03, um, or 04, excuse me. Um, and part, part of my time was out there managing the Christie Field Project. 
where um, you know after the installation phase of planting those um, hundred thousand species for the dunes and the marshes, uh, of course we had many many years of going after weeds with huge volunteer work parties. Um, so this is like the old days with you know awesome huge volunteer work parties pre-COVID. Um, so this is what I started doing um, in sort of in this field is just working with people and pulling weeds, doing you know managing rare plant monitoring and all that great stuff. Um, out at Presidio. And uh, and then I abandoned ship out there and founded Nature in the City in 2005, the organization. This is the third edition of the Nature in the City map. Um, and that's, it's still going strong, run by a gal named Amber Hasselbring. Um, they've got a great advisory council that runs the organization. They've got money, they keep going, they keep doing great projects, including the Green Hair Street Corridor, which you've probably heard of and many others. So check out natureinthecity.org. Um, and uh, and then so that was for a few years that I was leading the organization and and ended up basically kind of pivoting to working for the city uh, and for the Department of Environment. And this, of course, is our um, imagery that um, kind of encapsulates the city's overall environmental goals and climate action framework: zero eighty one hundred roots, zero waste, eighty um, percent sustainable trips. Although I think they're changing that to 80 percent. Um, oh, zero carbon trips, carbon free trips, and then 100 percent renewable energy and then roots, which is all the work that we do to, um, you know, restore our natural environment um, and plant plant plants and trees as many places as we can, not just to, to sequester carbon, but obviously for biodiversity and for greening and all the and all the social benefits of, the, of everything that we do. Uh, and so I was hired. Um, you know, to sort of say, look, let's uh, let's make the green more biodiverse. This is actually the second edition of the Nature in the City map, which is a nice way to say we're painting the gray green, but what kind of green is it? And so that's my job is to try to look at the whole city and look at all the opportunities and help create policies and help convene us all to to do a better job of um, of how we manage the landscape and how and what plants we plant, et cetera. Um, to um, create a wonderful biodiversity for native plants and animals um, across our whole uh, our whole landscape. So um, and recently, uh, so I'm just going to quickly share three hats, and and then the third hat will will go right into weeds. The three hats that I have in my current role: one is um, staff support for the Urban Forestry Council, which I just started about two years ago. Um, some of you may have heard of the of the San Francisco Urban Forestry Council. It's a 15 member body um, with uh, members appointed from in, um, five of the city departments. So Rec and Park, PUC, the Port, Planning and Public Works, as well as there's a representative for the Presidio Trust. And there are two uh, members appointed by the mayor and then seven. I've got my math right appointed by the Board of Supervisors. And it's basically how the public can have an opportunity really to engage uh, with um, experts and, and stakeholders on questions about urban forestry. And so the council has actually various um, responsibilities as part of the ordinance that created it, uh, including um, recommending the landmarking the landmark trees to the Board of Supervisors and just advising the board and, uh, and the mayor on urban forestry issues in general. So that's um, a good part of my time. And um, but kind of what I'm most known for, of course, is being overall biodiversity guy. And in 2018, we passed this policy um, that was unanimously passed by the Board of Supervisors as a resolution establishing local biodiversity as a citywide priority with a framework for interagency collaboration for nature based initiatives. And so um, have been uh, and even before that, but since that even more. Um, consistently and with and with this kind of extra oomph have been convening um, a very significant subset of these 15 city departments which were named in the resolution uh, to all work together again to, to lift up our efforts for um, uh, biodiversity in San Francisco and to collaborate and operationalize um, um, the lens of biodiversity in all of our work. And so pivoting to um, my on, I still have an on the ground role, thank goodness, thanks to the Treasure Island Development Authority, whose uh, icon you see, can see there at the bottom. And so I assist TIDA uh, in basically the management of Treasure Island and Yerba Buena Island. Uh, so this is the future 
um, like 20 years down the road of what Treasure Island and Yerba Buena Island are going to be looking like. Um, and thanks to some early advocacy, the Treasure Island portion on the left there um, is going to have a lot of open space built into it as part of the redevelopment. Uh, and then, uh, and so that's exciting. And so, uh, so my role is, you know, at this smaller scale, um, but also more on the ground and, and with a little bit more um, power, if you will, in terms of working with Tida and, and supporting them and, and helping them lead the charge alongside the developer is to say, you know, let's make sure that when we recreate these open spaces or create them rather that we do it with local native plants and we create a real truly biodiverse landscape out there on treasure island and meanwhile we're also implementing a habitat management plan for yerba buena island on the right which is the real island and does have some remaining natural areas um, which of course um, are uh, you know threatened with all kinds of issues um, not the least of which is you know the the island had been having been part of the Navy and being developed, but in part because it was part of the military, similar to the Presidio, um, there are these different uh, sites that remain. So this is just a map from the habitat management plan that shows the sort of matrix of the plant communities out there. Um, so um, finally getting to weeds. Thanks for your patience. Um, and hopefully um, that wind up made sense. So French broom is, of course, one of our um, worst weeds in the bay and i just learned that um there's not just janista monspeciliana however you say that maybe doug could help me with that that monspeciliana i can't even pronounce the french broom but i learned this one um through iNaturalist stenopetala and i um i texted the person um who id'd this differently from my id which i id'd as Janista Mons Pesalalanum, whatever you say. Um, and so this person was like, well, no, the inflorescences are actually um, terminal as opposed to French broom. So that's why it's stenopetala. stenopetala. Um, so um, maybe Doug will um, uh, help explain that, in fact, yes, we do have these two um, species and they're both invasive, but I imagine the other one's more than the other. So um, yeah, I just thought I'd go through a few slides of weeds um, in San Francisco. These are actually all from Yerba Buena Island. And um, again, just to get your juices flowing on the subject of weeds. Uh, so this is a Catoni aster, um, but all the ones I'm gonna show are also of course very dominant um, on the mainland, not just on the island, but I, since I work out there, I've got lots of pictures of weeds on YBI. Um, so this is, I believe, Cotoneaster panosa, um, which I didn't really key into until I was out on the island. It was a little bit up above um, Clipper Cove, above the beach there. The two that are sort of we're more de more normally dealing with are Cotoneaster franchetti and Cotoneaster um, lacteus. I think I'm saying it right. Uh, the former of which is kind of the larger one with even more pronounced veins, a uh, lot larger leaf that is. Um, so I'm sure some of you are familiar with Cotone Aster. And then, of course, the ivies, um, Algerian ivy and English ivy. And we've got a ton of that out on the island. And we all know all about ivy, of course, those of us who manage weeds. Um, and um, another question I have, is there a difference between Algerian ivy or, and Canary Island ivy? Or are they, both, are they uh, the same thing? That's another um, thing that came to me recently. Uh, so this is actually out on Treasure Island. This is from like 2014, um, quite a while ago, and it was actually taken by uh, Michael Chasse, who was my successor at the Presidio, actually. He's been there for years now. He's come out to the island a couple times. Um, but yeah, fennel being uh, super invasive, of course, also now uh, for many years, a host plant for the um, for the Anna Swallowtail butterfly. Um, but our local lepidopterist, Liam O'Brien, says, don't worry about bashing fennel. There's plenty of it all over the place. The NS Wallowtail is doing just fine. So do what you need to do um, to manage for, um, you know, your native plant community where fennel is invading it. Um, but, you know, if you have an area where you want to hold on to fennel and that's not otherwise spreading beyond or you're able to keep it under control, then, you know, then, yeah, then it is habitat for the NS Wallowtail. Uh, and of course, wild radish, <clears throat> another one of our favorites, can create just sort of monocultures and really take over the ground layer where nothing else is germinating. 
Um, I've been dealing with that weed since 1994, I guess. Um, mo likes the coast. Uh, I don't think it goes too far inland. Um, Doug could probably correct me on that. Uh, and of course, it, you know, it's basically our actual radish that we eat, but it escaped um, cultivation or early on. So this is one that I ha didn't know anything about until I got out to Yerba Buena Island. This is Canary Island Marguerite. Um, oh, let me see if I can get the, the genus and species off the top of my head. I think it starts with an A. Um, oh, it's escaping me at the moment. But it's obviously in the Asteraceae, in the sunflower family, a daisy. Um, and it is super invasive all along, kind of right above the shoreline, all the way around the island. Um, I see seedlings all over the place, and there's just kind of like a thicket that's just growing on the bluffs, which is horrible because the bluffs are great habitat for like um, our coast Dudleya, right? Um, Dudleya farinosa, um, lizard tail, and many other um, native plants, all of which um, you know are important insect plants. And uh, and so uh, we this is a high priority for um, for managing for management. Uh, but on these really steep cliffs that are right above the water, we're going to have it's going to be hard work. Um, but uh, we're so we're pushing it down to that zone so we keep it from from coming up. And um, we're working with Habitat Potential, uh, which is Josiah Clark's company. If you know Josiah, uh, and they were just out there bashing this weed yesterday. And then, of course, our favorite, Jake Sig's favorite, you know, Jake, who just turned 94, by the way, a couple days ago, uh, Oxalis pescapre, um, the worst weed in San Francisco is what Jake will say, I think. Um, you can see some other species in this photo, actually, but the yellow flowering Oxalis pescapre uh, and its bulblets and its runners and its just horrible ability to um, just stick in there um, and it causes real problems in the grasslands. Um, and even in shrublands and, you know, for the, in the understory, obviously, of shrublands and in woodlands. Um, and uh, yeah, we're always battling this guy. Ice plant, um, just because it's another nice picture of the beach. We all know ice plant. Um, although sometimes we learned out of the Presidio that ice plant can be your friend sometimes um, because it's kind of a monoculture. And sometimes, uh, unlike this pick where there is some other stuff growing out of it, often there's nothing else growing there other than ice plant. So, um, so it means you're not getting your other awful weeds, um, that can be a real pain. So, but when you remove it, they will come in right away or they're in the seed bank. So you need to be ready when you remove it, um, with what your approach is going to be, um, upon, um, excluding it from an area. Acacia, I think this is blackwood acacia um, when it's re-sprouting it does this kind of compound leaf thing um, uh, can be awful stuff just because it's you know it's re-sprouting a lot uh, and uh, definitely you need herbicide to paint the stumps or else you know forget it, it's always going to be re-sprouting um, and it can it's not like you know it's not as invasive as french broom or some of the others but certainly if it's left unchecked it can create its own monoculture um, and so obviously we manage for that guy too all right, so I'm going to finish up my little weed um, photo gallery here with some ones that I've been less familiar with um, over the years, although the one on the right, uh, Eupatorium or Thorough Wart, um, Adjuratina adenophora, um, that one I have been familiar with just because it was a huge problem in the Marin headlands. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on it in the GGNRA. It invades draws. Um, it's in the sunflower family, but it looks a lot like um, California bee plant, which is in the figwort family. Um, so, you know, leaves are very similar. The color is very similar when it's, you know, when it's not in bloom, um, because it's, of course, in, in a blooming shot. We have a really bad infestation of this on Yerba Buena Island, right above Clipper Cove Beach, above the willows. So we're going to be, that's a high priority for us to, to nail. Um, but on the mainland, it's not, uh, I've never seen it as a big problem, although I think it's still sold, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Doug might be able to confirm that. And um, I have seen it like kind of in the Castro um, in sort of moist locations where it could end up being a problem up on Twin Peaks, for example. So definitely one to look out for. Um, the one in the middle, I think, is Detrichia gravilons, if I'm not mistaken, which I learned from Doug is is not the worst to tricky there's a there's a worse one um and so we do have a little bit of this but we do have a little bit of this one on your Wayne island so this is sort of on our watch list for the island um and uh it's, it's a small amount so we're i think we're going to be able to keep on top of it and then on the left johnson grass i forget the genus of species of this one 
But this we found in this area, we call this the Nimitz Slopes. This is an area that was revegetated as part of um, the, the reconstruction of the um, westbound on and off ramps um, that are on the east side of the island um, as part of the Bay Bridge uh, reconstruction. And so you can see that that's the new Bay Bridge there. And so underneath all that whole construction areas of several acres of uh, landscape that was revegetated with California natives. It was done not by Tida, not by the city, um, although I guess in part by the County Transportation Authority, but basically by the transportation people. And Tida kind of didn't get in on it early enough. Um, and so it wasn't done with local natives, but it, it was done with California natives and they're actually doing pretty well, although we're having to manage them like crazy, manage the weeds like crazy. Um, Josiah's crew is out there, um, has been out there all the time. And he and I both discovered this Johnson grass that came in um, apparently either with, um, you know, erosion control or I don't know what, but I, I have not been familiar with this because I think in general, it's a little bit more inland, maybe not on the coast. Uh, and and this being the east side of your Buena Island, this is a much less foggy, you know, much less coastal location than than mainland than you know a lot of mainland San Francisco. So it seems to like it there, um, and so but definitely something to watch out for in general. Um, okay, so I just thought we could do a little um, round robin, popcorn, cracker jack, whatever you want to call it, um, and you could just shout out or write in the chat. What kinds of weeds are you dealing with? And um, as we're doing that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, because after we do that, we're going to move to Doug. So we'll go to the non screen sharing mode. And um, yeah, and just uh, for fun and to um, see who, see what's on people's minds in terms of your worst weeds, not blackwood acacia, maybe acacia de, de albata. Thank you, Don Thomas. Um, so feel free to, to jump in verbally um, or write in the chat. What are your, what are the weeds that are causing you the most problems that you have the most issues with or questions about, or um, you like the most because you like their flowers, anything, anything. Um, jump in. Maybe Chris has his favorite or his least favorite. Arundo Donax. Yes, Elizabeth Rosenblum. Thank you. Um, I was just looking at some Arundo yesterday. Where the heck was I? Skeleton weed. Skeleton weed. What's the genus on skeleton weed? Doug? Chandrilla. Oh, Chandrilla. Right, right, right. Okay. That's on the, yeah, Chandrilla. And that's on the, that's on the Calypsi list, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a CDFA yeah. noxious weed too. Oh wow, okay, there you go. That's a bad one. Cape weed, Arctotheca. Yeah, apparently there was a guy who was actually planting cape weed in the headlands way back in the in the early '90s, and maybe even in later in the '90s. Kind of crazy. Um, thank you, Mark. Chondrilla, Chondrilla, Chondrilla Junsea. One of my worst is Erharta Don Thomas. Yes, absolutely. I hate Erharta, um, although not as bad as. Um, Yellow oxalis, I don't think. Um, you can actually deal with their heart, to, but yeah, it's definitely pernicious. Thistle and burr clover, yep. Thank you, Anne, Ann Woods. Horsetail Equisetum arvensi, Diane. Okay, is that, isn't that a, is that a native or do I have that wrong? Equisetum arvensi. YST and PST, yes, yellow star thistle and purple star thistle, I guess is what PST is. Cool. This is awesome. Thank you, everybody. We'll keep keep putting them in the chat, um, and uh, and we'll just keep keep rolling with the with with the chat, and we can do that all throughout the meeting. Um, but I think now um, I can hand it over to to Doug, and he can do his thing. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Thank Peter. You um, can you see my screen? And yes, I know it's not in uh, full presenter mode. Yes, we can. OK, great. So I'm going to um, beg your forgiveness for staying in uh, editing mode here on the PowerPoint. Um, I've only got four slides because I want to spend most of the time looking at some other things uh, online and a document. And when I go to full screen, it ends up on my second screen and I lose track of uh, where the 
where the darn um, teams is. So if we can hang with this, I know it's a little small, but uh, this is a quick overview, and then I will go to the Calypsy website to show you these things in a little more detail. But I want to give you some background on who and what is Calypsy, and I um, really appreciate Peter's dive into weeds of San Francisco, both the San Francisco Six, um, I remember the brochure that came out back in the day from the WMA, um, but also some of the other things that you're seeing both on your Babuena Island and, and elsewhere in the city. Uh, the Johnson grass is definitely something I noted down because I'm curious where else that is in California. I think of that as mainly a, a weed of the Southeast. And uh, and yeah, the detrichia, I know they're the one the widespread one is the bad one, um, but there is a new one that I do want to talk about a bit later. But um, as background, stepping back, um, because it's actually Calypsy's 30th anniversary. We were formed in um, in 1992, and um, I saw Ingrid Cabada's name on on the screen here. I just spoke with Greg Archbald, who was up in. Um, the GGNRA, actually it was the Golden Gate National Parks Association, I think at the time, the Friends of group, that's now the Parks Conservancy. Um, and he gave me some insight into the beginnings of Calypsy and told some tales of, yes, people, uh, some person planting Cape weed um, up in the headlands and some of the longtime volunteers like Ingrid uh, that got everything rolling there and then how things how things spread. So the Bay Area is um, the original home of Calypsy, uh, but we are a, a statewide nonprofit. We have actually more on our board of directors, which has 15 people. We have more folks from Southern California um, currently. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. We are member member driven um, the first 10 years of the organization there were no staff and it was all volunteer um, and then uh, since 2002 we have had staff and we currently have six uh, staff members not all full-time um, so the board of directors did a whole bunch of stuff originally and they do a whole bunch of stuff now the members do a bunch it's very much a, a group effort and the members are um, comprised mostly land managers but also uh, researchers, ecological researchers, and restoration volunteers um, who make up a significant part of the workforce on the ground doing uh, doing weed management. So some of the things um, that Calypsy does, uh, there's a list here and there's more. Um, the primary thing that initially started was the annual symposium. So this year is our 30th symposium. It's happening in October. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's a gathering of people from out from throughout California to exchange information on invasive plant management. And that was key back in the day. I mean, it's still key now, but it was especially key then. And that's why the organization formed because people were working in wildlands on different invasive plants and there wasn't a lot of information published out there. It was being created at the time. And so if somebody, you know, in the next county over had figured out something constructive to do with Cape Ivy and you were struggling with that, you needed their information and likewise they might need to know something you knew. So that's what the foundation of the symposium is and it continues to this day with um, lots of presentations and discussion groups and posters, usually field trips, not this year because we're online, but one of the great things about being online is that uh, more people can attend for cheaper um, without having to travel and we can have speakers from basically all over the world. So I wanna point out there's that blue star there. Um, and for those of you getting DPR credit, uh, there will be um, 10 or a dozen questions at the end. And um, I just wanted to note uh, some of the places where the questions might uh, touch on. Actually, the questions do touch on. So one of the things to know about the uh, this year's symposium is that it will feature um, speakers from around the world. We have a session currently with someone from South Africa, someone from Australia, someone from British Columbia, someone from Chile, and someone from the UK, um, all sharing information about how weed management is an essential component of biodiversity protection elsewhere in the world. Moving on to the inventory, the second thing that Calypsy did um, and that was kind of a need was to put together a list 
of invasive plants in California. And this is not a regulatory list. This is not so CDFA, the State Department, California Department of Food and Agriculture maintains a list of noxious weeds and noxious weeds um, are legally regulated in various ways. The Calypsi inventory is a list of invasive plants that impact wildlands and that land managers need to know about. It's there as a guide for land management, whereas um, the CDFA noxious weed list grew up through agriculture um, over the years, starting primarily with crop weeds, and it has expanded somewhat to include environmental weeds. But so there's a lot of overlap between the two lists, but um, but there's also a fair amount of plants uh, that are on Calypsi's list that aren't on CDFA's list. Um, so again, the Calypsi inventory is not regulatory, it's just informational. Um, the third thing that Calypsi got into, um, some of you may remember the book, and, um, the Basic Plants of California's Wildlands that uh, John Randall of the Nature Conservancy and Carla Bassard from St. Mary's um, College of California and Mark Koshofsky of the California Department of Fish and Game at the time um, put together, which was kind of a from UC Press, a really nice book that um, went over 70 some odd invasive plants in California and gave information on where are they from, how do they grow, what's their reproductive strategy, what do we know about the best ways to control them, what are their impacts. Um, and so that was the beginning of pulling together resources on invasive plants. And so we have that as well as a lot more now in a resource library, which I'll show you in a minute. More recently, kind of in Calypsi, you know, more uh, in Calypsi 2.0, once we had uh, a decent amount of staff capacity, um, Cal Weed Mapper was constructed. It's uh, very symbiotic with Calflora. Um, many of you hopefully are aware of and use Calflora as a place to um, note observations in the field of um, plants, native plants, invasive plants, um, non-native plants that aren't invasive, any, any or all of the above. And we use it primarily as a place to look at invasive plant locations. Cal Weed Mapper uses data from Calflora, but also distribution information across the entire state from over 100 local interviews with experts, primarily through weed management areas, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, to say, hey, there aren't any points in Calflora where people have um, submitted reports of a population is it out? Is it there? Is it not there? So it's it's more detailed than a simple presence absence map, but in, in essence, that's what it is, is saying, well, we've got all the GIS data from points that people have logged, but we know that that's not representing everything that's out there. And we don't want to assume that just because there's no points in an area, that means it's absent. We want to ask experts, do you think it's there? Do you think it's absent? How widespread is it? Is it spreading? Those kind of things. So Cal Weed Mapper, which we'll look at in a minute, um, allows one to look at the statewide distribution of the weeds that are listed in the inventory. Um, we, Calypsi, have undertaken some landscape level weed management projects um, more recently, and that has tended to be where um, there's a project that needs a facilitator. Um, so a couple of them are the invasive Spartina project in, in the Bay, uh, San Francisco Bay. It's been going for um, over 15 years and it doesn't necessarily need us, but for some of the grant uh, grant money facilitation, it does need us, so we've gotten involved there. Um, down in the desert uh, of eastern San Diego County in Borrego Springs, there's a, a new plant, uh, desert knapweed, that's new to northern to uh, North America and uh, there's no obvious agency to take responsibility for that. So we've been kind of taking a lead and corralling various folks to work on that. Um, promoting IPM. So uh, invasive pest or invasive um, integrated pest management um, sometimes is understood by people as never use chemical tools or only use chemical tools as a, as a last resort. Calypsi has for a long time promoted a definition of IPM that is use all the tools in the smartest possible way. Be safe, be 
be effective, be cost effective, um, adjust depending on the situation. Um, if you have and you can include, you know, public concern is high, even if you don't think it's entirely founded in in uh, sound science and but you want to keep people from freaking out, <laughs> it's OK to, you know, adjust and say, well, we don't have to use herbicide here or maybe we use herbicide, but we don't use glyphosate because people are currently up in arms about that. So on our website, we do have a published policy on what is IPM, kind of the diversity of approaches, the diversity of tools, um, and also um, specifically some information on glyphosate to try to help people sift through everything that's that's going on with that. And then finally, weed management areas. Um, I left it for last because we're going to be transitioning into that, but it is certainly not last in our minds and hearts. Um, one of the principles of working on weeds is you can't just have tunnel vision and look at this property you have to look at a landscape level and to look at a landscape level you're going to necessarily be involving multiple jurisdictions so to have those jurisdictions work together well they need to be meeting in order to coordinate and collaborate um, and strategize and figure out okay um, yes, we see French broom all over the place, so maybe we need to work on that. But there's this new little detrichia over here um, that isn't bothering anyone yet, but it's a future concern. So can we get someone to get on that? It's not on any of our property, but let's figure out how to get on that. So that's one of the things that WMAs are really important for, um, as well as just outreach and collaborative mapping. So you know over the area that's covered and WMAs are typically county based. What's out there and you keep up to date on what people are seeing, so we'll talk more about that. OK, so I'd like to um, and hopefully the screen will switch um, with me. Um, so are you seeing the Calipsy website or are you still seeing the PowerPoint? We can see the website. Excellent, OK. Um, so this is the Calypsy website, and I want to uh, just go in order over the things um, I previously mentioned. And actually, I want to make sure I didn't skip a blue, a blue star there. Just a sec. Um, yeah, I think I covered that. Um, OK, so again, the symposium um, that is noted here uh, under the you know, call for abstracts. Our deadline is in a couple of weeks. Um, the registration is open. This will be online um, in late October. We had over 600 people attend last year. We usually have about 300, excuse me, 300 to 400. Um, we were planning to be in Chico last year and uh, ended up going online and had had 600 people attend. And this year we've decided to stay online as well. Um, and we'll see what the future holds, whether we try to have a hybrid where people can attend online and or in person. We'll figure that out. Um, but that's a, a great time to come learn a whole bunch of stuff. The the uh, program itself will be out in July, and I believe the um, early bird registration rate um, ends in August sometime. So you have a chance to look at the program if you want and decide um, if you want to come. It's I think the early bird registration for members is something like seventy five dollars, so it's it's pretty reasonable. It's normally more like three hundred dollars in person because there's food and other things involved. Um, and again, uh, we will have speakers from uh, around the world as well as really focusing in on California. The theme this year is expanding community to protect biodiversity. So because of California's 30 by 30 initiative to protect 30% of the state's lands by 2030 um, and the biodiversity aspect of that, there's a focus on biodiversity protection. At the same time, um, Calypsy is putting energy into uh, community engagement, um, equity, diversity and inclusion work, um, traditional ecological knowledge. So uh, expanding community is also a primary part of the theme. Um, OK, so the inventory um, and this will take a, a minute to load. Um, but under plants here, there there are several different ways to to look at our plants. But the, the inventory is kind of the most robust tabular format um, that will help you link to um, various aspects of each plant. So, you know, it's a long list. Uh, you can, you know, by scientific name, common name, and then the Calypsy rating. So we have limited 
uh, impact, moderate impact, or high impact, something like barbed goat grass here. And then you can see we have watch species as well. So those are ones where um, several years back, we used the um, pre-assessment tool developed by PlantRate, um, a collaboration that we're a part of, uh, which is more of a predictive tool. So we took a list of 200 plants that non-native plants that are growing in the wild in California, but aren't known to be invasive yet. They aren't really causing problems that people can tell. And we ran them through this screen, a 20 question screen called the pre-tool, the plant risk evaluator. And the ones that came out as a high risk, about 80 of them are now listed as watch plants on the CALBC inventory. Um, we have the CDFA rating here, which is helpful because CDFA ratings are not very uh, easy to find <laughs> online through CDFA. Um, and that's so that's the noxious weed ratings, and that has um, an implication as to whether they're regulated or not. Whether the plant is known from horticulture, um, this is a link to Cal Weed Mapper, CWM is Cal Weed Mapper, and we'll look at that in a moment. If we have an ID card for the plant, this links to that. And then the PAF or the PRE, I mentioned the PRE is the predictive assessor. Um, the plant assessment form is our normal assessment. It's got 13 criteria for determining um, whether a plant is invasive at all, and if it is, is it at a limited, moderate, or high level? Um, so you can click through. Um, if you were to click on one of these, and I know we were just talking about um, acacia, this will actually go to what we call the plant profile for that plant, which has um, detailed information about it. Um, it will go to um, the UC Davis Weed Research Information Center. Um, often they will have a detailed note on how to um, manage the weed, and if so, we link there. If there are newsletter articles from the Calypsi newsletter, they'll be listed here. Um, if there are symposium presentations, they'll be listed here. Um, this species isn't, you know, if you looked at this for a rundo, there'd be <laughs> dozens and dozens of articles and presentations um, and then other information. So it's kind of a one stop shop. You can go to Cal Flora, Cal Photos and look at images of Acacia del Bada. You can go to Cal Flora and see the maps of this, Cal Weed Mapper, et cetera. So the inventory and the profiles associated with it are really a, a rich area for you to find out about any particular given plant. So let's look at the resource library here. And this is where all our publications end up. And so we have been funded at various times by um, various agencies to develop um, best management practices manuals um, or reports. And so some of the more recent ones, um, so we have best prevention, best management practices for land managers. Um, the most recent one under BMPs is this BMPs for non-chemical weed control. So the State Department of Pesticide Regulation gave Calypsia a grant to develop these, these BMPs, and they're basically calling information from experienced land managers on everything from, you know, how to use a hula ho to, um, you know, steamers and heavy machinery, biocontrols. There's, there's a ton of information in here, and this project ends at the end of this month, and so we're really close to publishing the online tool through UC IPM that will be a decision support tool um, that will help a user determine for their given plant and situation which um, tools and techniques would be most effective and then when they drill down they'll get the bmp for those those specific tools and then reports the most recent one here um, stewarding california's biodiversity early detection and rapid response for invasive plants is one that we um, did with funding from the california landscape stewardship network Sharon Farrell, who was uh, Pete mentioned, Peter mentioned, um, is leading that up um, out of one TAM and GGMPC. And this is a report that basically puts on paper what we all know about uh, the benefits of early detection rapid response and tries to make the strongest possible case for it and then makes recommendations to state agencies in California for how they can support um, how they can support EDRR for invasive plants so that biodiversity can be protected. And um, wouldn't you know it, funding weed management areas is the top recommendation. So we'll get to that. Um, let's take a quick look at Cal Weed Mapper. Um, so this is just while um, Peter was talking, I brought up uh, 
wild radish and indeed let's see if I can zoom in here. Indeed, it's not just on the coast, which is interesting. Um, it looks the uh, you can see the. The white triangles pointing downward, that means it's being worked on and decreased in those quads, so that's interesting. Um, actually, I can probably ramp the color back here. I can see where we're looking. Um, so in San Francisco, actually, it looks like that's the one where it was spreading. It had the the black, the black dot. Um, so anyway, this this is information. The uh, quad information here. These are USGS quads, um, seven and a half minute quads, and they. The information comes from both those interviews, or if there is data from Calflora. So if we bring up occurrence observations, as well, um, that should populate. Um, so it's also using that data from Calflora to populate these quads. So you can see up here in a quad with no Calflora data, that's just purely on expert opinion that it's there. And we have different shading for different amounts of it, and the symbols mean different things. So without going into it too much, there's a lot of information here that allows us to look at where things are at on the landscape level. We also were able to do some um, suitable range modeling to say, hey, we're um, based on where this grow? Oh, this one does not have a model. Actually, I can't do it. Um, but where where does this grow now? Where do we think it could grow based on where it grows now? What is the suitable climatic area within the state? And then how does that change by mid-century? What are areas that are now suitable for the plant that weren't before? What are areas that are now not suitable for the plant that were suitable before? So that's Cal Weed Mapper, um, and that connects to our um, regional programs. So uh, one of them that I'll look at here, if we, <coughs> excuse me, if we go to our homepage, those uh, graphics across the, the top um, are our, a couple of our projects, um, but then we have a list of all of our projects. Um, there's a dozen or so of them, and one of them is the um, San Francisco Bay Sea Lavender Control, and this one is interesting in part because the San Francisco County Weed Management Area um, and the San Francisco County Department of Agriculture, which um, is a central player in the weed management area, are one of the funders of this effort, um, as are um, Alameda County, Marin County, San Mateo County, and Santa Clara County. And so this is a, a weed that is um, kind of an up and comer in the Bay Area, um, San Francisco State University, uh, Kat Boyer there um, has been a lead with some of her grad students in mapping it and analyzing it across the Bay. Um, it's not huge in stature like um, Spartina Alterniflora hybrids are, but it does um, start to really take over in the upland areas. And so we're catching it pretty early. There's only something like 16 or initially there were something like 16 acres of it across the entire net acres of it across the entire Bay Area, but that's in like 85 different locations. Some of them huge, some of them small, some of them easy to reach, some of them very remote. The reason we know about those is because the Spartina folks are out there in the marshes already doing their Spartina work. And so they started keeping their eye out for this as well. Um, so there's uh, manual work happening in Marin um, to avoid herbicide use, but that's very expensive. Um, you can see some of the mounds here being treated. I think this might be at um, Oyster Point. Um, so there are some locations in, in San Francisco County that are still being being treated. Um, I know out at uh, um, Heron's Head with uh, Literacy for Environmental Justice, I may be getting the name wrong, um, Ledge, they're, they've been working on it and they're now at the point where they can revegetate. Um, so that's, that's exciting. Um, so we've been working on that for about four years and we have funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as well as the counties to continue that work. All right, let's talk about w, um, uh, WMAs. I could show you the IPM. Um, let me just go to the back to the home page here. Um, if you wanted to get to, oh, where's the IPM? I'm not sure if the link is still here. So maybe it's not. Um, so I would have to dig for that a little bit, but we used to have a, when it, especially when glyphosate was in the news all the time, 
we had a uh, one of these here that went directly to the um, to the policy and uh, information on glyphosate. Um, OK, so let's talk about WMAs. So they are under solutions here. They are one of the the key things that has evolved um, over time in the state and uh, they initial initially got started in. Um, so here's a, a list of them and a, a map of them throughout the state. So let me go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so who and what is a weed management area? It's a funny name because it's really a group, but this name came to us because uh, people had already started weed management areas elsewhere. Um, Yellowstone, the Yellowstone Ecosystem Partnership was one of the early ones. And now I'll just take a look at this map. I mean, there are coordinating groups around um, invasive plant management. Some of them are more than just plants. They're invasive species, all taxa. Like in Florida, they have um, CISMAs, Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas. And in New York, they have PRISMs, Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management. But basically, these things are all over the place. It's a, an idea that just makes sense. Um, so it's not just a California thing. Um, and so that's uh, maybe why that blue star is there, because they're all over the country. Um, the blue star here is because WMA stands for Weed Management Area. Um, they're typically run through each county's agricultural department, but sometimes not. Sometimes it's a resource conservation district, an RCD, um, or another entity. Um, grants, the funding for these come through the California Department of Food and Agriculture, CDFA, and there was steady funding from more or less steady funding from around 2000 to 2010 and it was kept there by advocacy from calypsi and by calypsi i mean the whole community we on the staff would organize uh, enough to know when letters needed to be sent to which legislators we ran a couple bills and some budget requests and then got the community of of weed management weed managers and their organizations around the state to send um, letters to the right people at the right time to help keep that funding there. But in the budget crisis um, in 2010, the um, funding was cut. And it, even though we've advocated continuously or off and on since then, when there does seem to be a window of opportunity, we weren't able to get it back until 2018. Um, and I won't go into the details of what is there and isn't there, but we're still advocating to try to get it in this year's budget, um, which seems like a no brainer since there is a budget surplus and there's all this talk about protecting biodiversity, et cetera. But it is through the California Department of Food and Agriculture, which does make it a little difficult um, to always have it, if it's protecting biodiversity, have it compete against agricultural programs. So the um, goals of weed management areas are to get high priority projects done to kind of use your group mind to say what's going on around the county or two counties if that's what our WMA covers and what's really a high priority and then how can we design a project that gets the right players involved and take the grant money that we can get from CDFA and target it at those projects. And then just to share information, um, there hasn't been funding um, for the last 10 years or eight years. So, um, a lot of the WMAs have kind of gone dormant because there hasn't been enough capacity to keep them going, but some have kept meeting. Um, notably, the, the San Mateo County WMA has, has kept going strong um, here locally, and just the, uh, the value of sharing information has kept people coming together. So as you can see, the so each of these WMAs um, has a page, and I think Peter will talk a little bit more about the San Francisco WMA. Um, but you've got WMAs in, you know, urban San Francisco. You've got WMAs up in Siskiyou County. I don't know what the relative um, number of people per square mile is between those counties, but it's pretty radically different, obviously. Um, so there's a lot of different circumstances in the state um, in terms of managing weeds from, you know, watershed protection in urban areas to you know, extensive rangelands and, and forests and other parts of the state. So with that, um, the last thing I think I want to talk about is just the Bay Area collaboration because there's a lot of strength in the Bay Area WMAs. And so one of the things um, we've worked on recently collaboratively with the Bay Area WMAs is talking about 
um, not just within your WMA, what's the strategy, but regionally between WMAs, what's the strategy? So one of the efforts is on regionally rare weeds. And so this was done, it kind of follows on the heels of the Baden uh, Bay Area Early Detection Network effort um, a decade ago that some of you may remember, um, which was prioritizing early detection. Let's take the things that are just getting started that we can get with relatively low effort now and make sure we get on top of those. So this is a similar approach, um, whereas I think the Baden list had something like 70 uh, weeds. This this just has 15. Um, and so these are the 15 regionally rare weeds. The ones in green are the only two of this that are in found in San Francisco. So we have done a document like this for each of the counties in the Bay Area. So in different counties, we'll have different ones of these 15, but they're rare, so not all counties necessarily have them. So the Japanese knotweed, um, actually there's a ton of it up in <laughs> Marin County, but they've got a specific project, the Marin Knotweed Action Team, that's got funding to keep on it. And I always forget the watershed. Peter, I'm sure, knows it being a Marin County resident. Um, and uh, but throughout the rest of the Bay Area, it's very rare. So as this says, one mapped location in San Francisco County, and then this another Detrichia. So Detrichia graviolens is the one that you know 20 years ago maybe we could have done something about it when it was uh, you know I think of John Bell talking about it down in the South Bay, but now it's you know it's really spread widely across the state. Well, this Detrichia viscosa is something that has been in Solano County, a small infestation that as far as we knew was the only one in North America. Um, Dean Kelch with CDFA has found a few other populations, including these two in, in Hunter, um, Hunter's Point. And uh, so that's something definitely to get on quickly. We don't know how bad it might be someday, but gosh, why wait and find out? So this document has more information about um, how to, whoop, hmm, interesting. All right, well, um, how to enter stuff into Calflora and looks like the graphics are not showing up for some reason. Um, but basically what we did was pulled information out of Calflora with maps that show exactly where these populations are. That's one of the beauties of Calflora is you can zoom in um, like on a Google map and see precisely where the observation is. It's got all the information on who saw it, when they saw it, et cetera. Um, so you could always contact the, the observer if you needed even more information. So that's one of the projects we're working on with Bay Area um, WMAs. We'd like um, the WMA partners to try to make sure that the mapping information on all of these populations of these rare weeds are up to date and then ideally to manage them. Um, and that takes some coordination. So we're just getting started on that and hope that uh, you know a year from now we could come back to you and say, well, yep, we've got them all. They've all been mapped and most of them are being controlled. That would be the goal. Um, so Peter, I think that's a good place for me to, to stop and hand it back to you to talk about the San Francisco WMA. Okay, great. Thank you, Doug. Um, since we are, since we are gonna transition back to me, maybe um, just to keep this nice and friendly and casual um, and to give you a couple mi minutes before you've got to hear hear my mug again. Does anybody have any questions right now or um, any thoughts? Um, we can take a couple minutes just to sort of pause if you'd like. Um, thanks for um, continuing to write things in the chat. It reminds me, uh, I was going to mention, I'm, I'm a huge tennis, obsessed tennis fan. The French Open's going on right now and I've been, I listened to it on French Open radio as so I was walking this morning and they said, send in your tweets, send in your emails. So same thing here, just keep sending your things in the chat. <laughs> in the chat. Um, anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I, I'm happy to jump back into the rest of my piece. Chris? In, in, unless, unless someone else submits a question, I'm going to ask mine. So now's your chance. Someone says we need rodent management areas. Okay. <laughs> nice. Well, that has <laughs> it has been uh, contemplated whether California's weed management areas should become invasive species management areas um, and take on more taxa. And there's there's nothing stopping you from doing it if it if it makes sense. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have a I have a question. I, I mean, thank you, thank you both for for all this information. Um, you know. I'm, I'm curious with regard to um, 
Telflora and Weed Mapper, if you have been involved in or promoting projects that are sort of crowdsourcing projects to uh, that use those tools, especially Weed Mapper, it seems like something that would be ideal for high school classes or college classes. Uh, and and you know at the same time gather a whole lot of information all over the place. Um, well, that that is an interesting question. Um, as you know, iNaturalist is a total phenomenon, and so um, that's wonderful. And we're uh, working with Calflora to develop a system so that Calflora isn't just open to taking everything in that, that iNaturalist has because it's too much and it's not all accurate. Um, but there is an agreement that they can do that. And so we're looking at ways to um, make sure that the useful information from iNaturalist makes it into Calflora. But in terms of, um, I mean, yes, there are examples of community, you know, it's kind of the BioBlitz approach. I mean, community uh, um, efforts to map plants, whether they're weeds or other plants. I think of the San Diego Natural History Museum as being a really strong example of that. Um, but it is it is tricky if you're, um, you know, if one of the strong strategies is early detection, rapid response, um, and so you're trying to spot things that are either brand new or very rare, that's like looking for a needle in a haystack, and that's not very motivating to the masses, perhaps, but it might be motivating to a CMPS chapter where they're already out there looking for things. So it's maybe a little more of a passive, like, oh, I just saw something, as opposed to you're out looking for something. Um, whereas when there's something widespread, which is perhaps more of an appropriate target, excuse me, for um, for a community effort, the information may not be as useful. Um, so I don't know that that's been entirely figured out. Um, maybe the sweet spots in the middle where there's something that's not super rare, but not super widespread, and you need folks to go out and pour over an area and see where it's at. I know the Pacific Northwest Invasive Plant Council has an active program with the Forest Service where the Forest Service, because they don't have capacity to hike all their trails and map for weeds, enlist volunteers to do just that. And so they sign up for, OK, I'm going to go, you know, during this month when certain things are visible, I'm going to hike these trails and note everything I see and turn the turn the data in. So there are there are things like that. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks, Doug. Thanks for the question, Chris. So uh, we have a question from Jim. Yeah. Uh, can we help support WMAs getting funding by sending in letters or something else? If so, who would we contact? Yeah, that that well. So Calypsy tries to coordinate that effort. Um, and in the past, we have coordinated these massive like, you know, I think in 2006 we got funding back for WMAs be, in, in part because we had a coalition of environmental folks and agricultural folks sending by fax <laughs> letters to um, uh, to legislators offices and they were impressed by the breadth and quantity of of um, communications they received. So that's been the kind of grassroots approach we used historically. In more recent years, we've been working with a consultant in Sacramento and um, I keep asking like, can we can we send letters now? Can we send letters now? And the answer is typically like it's such a the the budget process is so kind of weird and behind closed doors and black box that it's um, it's hard to really find a way to focus people's um, lobbying that way. So I think that the general way that we can all do it is by meeting with our legislators in their local offices and making sure that our state legislators and making sure that they are aware of the importance of, in, of managing invasive plants. Um, if you're in an urban area, they may say, what the heck are you talking about? But you um, sometimes, like especially in Southern California, we talk about fire, we talk about water resources, we talk about recreation resources. Um, I certainly think uh, a lot of San Franciscans would be interested in protecting biodiversity, <clears throat> um, certainly with the ongoing um, work that Peter and others are doing. So th that could be a motivating factor as well. Um, so I think that is the best the best way. It's it's a little bit more of the ground game um, of just making sure that they're aware so that when something does happen, they know that it's an important issue. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Doug and Jen, for that question. So I'm going to um, 
I'm going to jump back into <clears throat> the rest of my presentation, which is going to be about the San Francisco weed management area. And I'm going to try to share my screen and the way that Doug did of just sharing um, just sharing my computer so I can toggle back and around. So for a moment, you're going to see double, I think. Um, so bear with me while I do that. Uh, so do you see, let's see, no, I want to take you here. Do you see the picture of the Maricor with radish again? Yes. Fantastic. All right. So this is Google Chrome. So I'm going to use this for a moment. So this is the San Francisco Weed Management Area website, which is totally old school. It was made in 2005 by my father, actually. Um, because uh, when I was still at the Park Service in the Presidio in that role um, as the Restoration and Stewardship Coordinator for the Presidio between 02 and 04, I kind of led the resurrection of the WMA at that time, the SFWMA. Um, there was a person who had been the County Ag Commissioner, I think, um, who left and so it sort of was, um, had languished and so I we, we resurrected it back then, and um, what that meant was, uh, and that was when it was um, getting funding, as, as Doug mentioned before 2010, when we lost the funding. So we did have some funding for the WMAs back then. And so what we had to do was we had to work together, uh, you know, create a collaboration of our different entities. And you can see down there on the lower left who was involved back then. Chris was even involved back then. Um, and in fact, I was leading meetings at the old location of the Department of Environment on Grove Street across from the library before I was even an employee there. Um, so thanks, Chris, way back in those days for letting me poke him about the WMA and, and help us bring money to San Francisco. Uh, so we had to uh, create a strategic plan that was part of what was required for us to get money. So this is just what that was. Um, uh, as you know, in order to create the framing for our um, to show that we knew what we were talking about and that we knew what, what, what our priorities were when we were to spend the funding. And then um, and then we had an MOU among the different entities. So in terms of what we did, uh, we were able to put together at what wrong link. Sorry, let me get to the right link. Here it is. Uh, a weed list. So uh, Doug just showed you the weed list for cat that Calypsy produces with, that is statewide. That's very sophisticated um, with uh, lots of categories and um, has gone through all kinds of versions over the years. Well, this basically is one version <laughs> still from 2005. Um, we haven't really updated it since then. So. Um, uh, it needs to be updated, but uh, it was a start for us back then to create our own San Francisco weed list. And we create, and you can see the the columns there with the Calypsy rating and the CDFA rating. Again, Cal Calypsy's old old style back in those days. Um, and then we just had a simple rating here in San Francisco. <clears throat> pardon me, uh, of one, two, and three. And in this case, it's ordered by the top ones um, and so some of these would probably still be ones and some of these would probably still be twos um, but you know it's been 16 years so we you know some of this might move around a bit but just to give you a sense of what we were thinking back then um, so you can see our heart down there and cape ivy and pampas grass chibata grass yellow star thistle um, italian thistle yellow oxalis etc are all ones um, so, and then we also created a, okay, that's the weed list, um, a brochure for the San Francisco six worst weeds. So this was a, so that, so the weed list of course was, you know, for science and for practitioners um, to have to sort of have that as a guide for what our priorities were in general. Um, and then this was an effort to try to educate um, the general public and decision makers about uh, weeds in San Francisco. Uh, so we produced this again. This was uh, back in 2008, I guess you can see the date there on the on the. This is a tri trifold um, brochure. So uh, again, this is also pretty old by now, 13 years old, um, but something that we you know we were handing out for years and uh, just trying to educate the public about weeds in San Francisco. 
Um, and then um, in 2010, we, we uh, used some of the funds from the state to produce a report called Weeds of San Francisco, Preliminary Mapping and Assessment Report for WMA Strategic Planning. Um, and this had, a, and there was a great guy who was working with us at the time. Um, oh my God, his name is escaping me, but uh, he had GIS skills and I think he was getting his master's. And so um, he was the one who put this report together for us. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of the, of what we did um, as part of this report. Um, so for example, uh, we, and I'm going to go back to the slideshow here. Um, he produced all kinds of different maps um, of uh, using the lists from everybody who was working on weeds at the time and where they were located and he put into a GIS and created maps of all of our uh, uh, sort of across different categories. This is the San Francisco 6 mapped across uh, across San Francisco um, and of course um, you know the 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 places where these are mapped are generally the natural areas because it's our you know local biodiversity that that is the focus of what we're trying to protect uh, when we're talking about invasive plants um, in our parks and natural areas so that's you know that's reflected in this map and now let me go back to here um, let's see and then this was just a huge weed list that uh, that he created um, with uh, basically every weed in the county that we can that was considered a problem and then uh, the columns are all the locations so again that was a huge kind of geographic information system effort uh, and then those are other maps um, and then this is a list uh, which i just think is kind of interesting because um, these were species at the time that were identified as not being on any priority list um, but that's a lot of species right a lot of non-natives some of which um, are considered invasive. Some of the, some natives on here, so maybe this just includes native plants too. But um, but I think this is mostly mostly non-native. So you can see, you know, not every, we don't consider every every single non-native plant to be an invasive, as as everybody knows. Um, there's a there's a subset of them that that are considered to be really problematic, right? So um, so that was an effort that we undertook. Uh, and then um, just kind of wrapping up on the report here, um, here was another list that uh, was produced as part of that report, a watch list weed. So this is interesting for our discussion today because skeleton weed was brought up in the chat, chondrilla. Uh, so that was considered a watch list weed back then, um, as was stinkwort, detrichia gravillans, um, harding grass, perennial pepper weed. Uh, many of these are very familiar. There's a Eupatori thoroughwort, the one I showed the um, photograph of on Yerba Island earlier. So um, there's a Rundo, which was mentioned earlier today. Okay, so you know we've got a lot of alignment um, with uh, 15 years ago with what we're talking about today. So obviously these weeds are persistent. Um, yeah, so that's the report. And um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, just quickly highlight a project that we did as the WMA. Um, and again, this was um, because um, this project was chosen um, because if you look at this map of Twin Peaks and you, and you know the Twin Peaks geography, you know that uh, there in the, in, the, in the map on the left, so kind of the yellow color um, that's highlighted is Reckon Park's land. And then in the blue, uh, is actually uh, kind of a combination of the Department of Real Estate and uh, I think it's maybe it's just the Department of Real Estate, that area in blue. And then the area in purple is all the PUC now, although um, it used to be the San Francisco Fire Department. And so this was an area of land owned by the Fire Department um, where, you know, so that they didn't, they, their priority was and they didn't have budget for managing invasive weeds. And so Rec and Park, and Nature in the City and um, Department of Environment um, and the rest of the collaborators worked together to, to and, and CMPS, excuse me, the California Native Plant Society, we all worked together to create a project up on Twin Peaks to um, manage broom and other invasives um, at two locations, this, this spot here um, kind of along uh, Twin Peaks Boulevard, 
uh, and then and then the southern location there at the northern slopes on fire department land um, uh, along the S curve there of uh, of Twin Peaks. And that was a that was a great success. Um, we've got a lot of weeds bashed as part of that project. And uh, and now actually this is part of PUC's land. Um, the fire department ended up transferring this land to the to the water department. Uh, and now through an interdepartmental work order in the same way that that the Treasure Island Development Authority pays Department of Environment for me to support them out on Treasure Island, Yerba Island. Well, the PUC gives money to Rec and Park to help manage its natural areas within the city, the PUC's natural areas, this being one of them. So, so now this area is being managed by the Natural Resource Division of Rec and Park as part of that arrangement. Um, so um, luckily, uh, we were able to continue following up on on that uh, on that project, and it was a success. A success. So. Um, so gonna kind of wrapping it up here, giving you kind of an overview of the San Francisco weed management area. But then I've got um, a couple slides that I thought were interesting to show um, regarding plants. So this is hot off the presses as of June 1st this year, uh, which is an update to the San Francisco flora. And this is done by our colleague Mike Wood, who is uh, again a, a long time um, board member of the Yerba Buena chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And Mike has been a botanist forever, um, since the 80s probably. And he um, took it upon himself during COVID because he had retired and was holed up on Oahu to redo this incredible resource. And so this, I've just taken a couple excerpts from it, but um, uh, contact me if you want to get this information, but you can also go to his website, which is wood-biological.com, wood -biological um, which I'll put in the chat, or maybe someone can look it up for me uh, while I'm talking and put that in the chat, because uh, this is an incredible new resource, uh, updated, but incredible amount of information about all of the plants that exist in San Francisco's parks and natural areas, the natives and the non-natives. And so this little excerpt shows um, what remains um, of all taxa and well as indigenous and non-indigenous. So if you look at the um, kind of the dark highlight for native taxa or indigenous taxa, historically we had 769 species. Currently we have 508 species of native plants that still live in San Francisco. Now that to me is just an absolutely remarkable figure considering that across the whole state or the California Floristic Province, I forget which, we have about 7,000 species of native plants, which is a huge number compared to other parts of the country. But if you, you think you take that 500, less than 5% of our natural environment remains in San Francisco. And, and, and we're a postage stamp, just the city itself across. So it's an, it's an amazing number. So, and then this also shows what's been extirpated. So uh, 261 plants are documented as having been extirpated from the city um, over over this period since um, you know since pre-colonial times. So um, so 34 percent extirpated, uh, and, and so uh, it's an ongoing um, process of really elimination of species. Um, we have wonderful biodiversity remaining, but it's it's very much threatened still. Um, by all kinds of um, issues, including invasive plants. Uh, and so this is another interesting excerpt that shows you um, the most frequently occurring invasive plant taxa. Okay, so Oxalis pescapre, according to his analysis, um, is, the, is the most commonly found invasive plant. 84 areas of among all the areas uh, that are documented as part of this uh, this checklist, as he calls it. Um, so that's 80% of, of all of the areas. Erharte recta, 76 of the areas. Um, so these are our most common uh, in terms of geography uh, invasive plants, um, Himalayan blackberry, ripgut brome, et cetera, the ivy, um, uh, English ivy. And then um, if you look on the right, this one is also very telling in terms of the precariousness of our native flora, right? So this is talking about the extant indigenous taxa, so that 508 that I mentioned earlier. And so, um, and on the left column, it says the number of occurrences. So among the 508 that we have, 
94 of those only have one occurrence in the county. 41 of those only have two occurrences. So of the 508, 170 have between one and three occurrences in the county. So one third of our extant flora of that 508 are you know really, really uncommon and very rare in the county. Some of those are rare plants, you know, literally globally rare plants that are on the CNPS statewide inventory. Others are what we call locally significant plants or locally rare plants. Um, and that's something like California buckeye, for example. We don't have, you know, many occurrences of California buckeye um, in the in the parks and natural areas of San Francisco. Um, but then there are all these other diminutive, you know, herbs and forbs that uh, that are, you know, right on the brink. So our 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 native flora and our fauna, of course, are um, are constantly in need of of our help and protection. Uh, and invasive plants are a way are the, you know really our biggest challenge in that respect. Now I found out recently from Lisa Wayne and uh, the video that she just did that the Mission Blue is doing pretty well on Twin Peaks thanks to all of the, their efforts. Um, but obviously without those efforts uh, we wouldn't have the Mission Blue. So um, that's really important. And this slide is just to kind of recognize all of the organizations that have been involved in this work. Um, over the years and continue to be, um, and many of which are represented among all of you today, um, at least if you're from San Francisco. And so thanks for all your hard work and we want to continue this work together. And so now what we wanted to do um, is kind of wrap up with uh, um, a question about, you know, what what are the projects that you think um, we that uh, folks could be collaborating on together. What are our priorities? Um, what 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 could we benefit from? Inter which projects could benefit from um, you know the collaboration of the WMA and and putting priorities to to different weeds and different project sites around the county. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to just kind of have that discussion.